In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you for what our ears are hearing, what revelations you are giving us. We thank you for the challenges you send through the youth that life without Christ is shattered dreams. And Lord, we bring ourselves to you that you'll take us completely and our lives will become useful, profitable to the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. We pray that all selfish plans which are planned without the recognition of the Lordship of Christ, that you will take all such plans away from every life in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that you make us to hear your call and to respond to your call. And we pray that our lives will be so useful in the kingdom of God that God's own desire will be fulfilled through every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Be with us as we come together to examine the scriptures now. I pray that you will speak to every heart and the influence, spiritual influence and impact that that song has already upon us and ministering to us. I pray it will never be rubbed off, but it will do its work until all within us is fully surrendered to the Lord. We've wandered away, but we have come back home. We want to serve the Lord. Make us channels of blessings. In Jesus' name, we pray. The session we come to now is Bible teaching. And because it's Bible teaching, we'll need to go perhaps slowly and yet very decidedly and deliberately into scripture to see what the Lord has for you and for me on the call and qualification for spiritual leadership. As you know and you are conscious of this, that when the Leadership Strategy Congress We've collected together key leaders who are involved in the work of the Lord. And I'm sure that you count yourself as an individual leader, very strategic to the work of the kingdom of God. Not just because of the name or the title that you bear, but because God has a particular work a particular assignment for you to carry out in the kingdom of God. And as we look at this message in particular, I want you to think as if there were no other leader. And think about yourself that God has raised you up to accomplish something through you that others cannot do. That you will become the voice of the Lord, the hands of the Lord. You will be possessed so much with the might of Christ. That you will have the vision of heaven, the heavenly vision within you. And you will move as one, completely controlled by that heavenly vision. See yourself as that leader. In the kingdom of God, in your own locality, that should you fail in the assignment the Lord has given you, tens, hundreds, or thousands of souls may perish because of your failure and your negligence. And as I look at the call and qualification for spiritual leadership, 
and we'll go through the scriptures together. And I trust the Lord will speak to your heart and my heart. I do not want you to lose hope. The word of God is high above every one of us. And it is possible as we share these together, a question may arise in your mind. Saying, who is sufficient for these things? The tendency may come, like Moses, that will tell the Lord, O oh Lord, I cannot do this. Send by the hand of whom you will send. But as for me, I do not have the gift, I do not have the grace, I do not have the power, I do not have the talent to get the job done. Remember the answer of the Lord when he said to Moses, who has made man, who has made his mouth. He said, I the Lord have made you, I will put the word in your mouth. We cannot lower the standard of the revelation of the word of God for the fear that if we keep the standard as high as the Bible puts it, people may get discouraged. The standard is always high. It's always been high. It will continue to be high. But don't act like little Jeremiah in the Bible that said, O oh Lord, I'm just a child. The Lord responded and answered him, Say not, I am a child. You will go to the people, you will go to the places which, to the place I will send you. When you look at what we have in scripture, it may appear that it's above you. It's above everyone. Because it will take the grace of God. It will take unction from above. Before we can do what the Lord wants us to do. The subject of leadership is a very serious matter in scripture. God places it that is the subject of leadership at the very top of his priorities in kingdom work whoever leads the church will determine what that church becomes the life the ministry the testimony the character and the emphasis together with the spirituality of the church are all determined by the leadership of the church what God did for Israel through the prophet he endeavors to do today for the church through the leaders and Osea sums it up very well in a very beautiful way the ministry of the prophet in the land of Israel in Osea chapter 12 and in verse 13, Osea chapter 12, verse 13, it says, And by a prophet the Lord brought out Egypt, brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet was he preserved. There you see the two things that God did for the children of Israel, and He did it through the prophet. Number one, he brought Israel out of captivity, out of bondage, out of slavery, out of the strange land. Number two, he established, he preserved the nation Israel by the ministry of the prophet. Although there is no time for me to go into all the ramifications of the ministry of the prophet, but from this you can see the central purpose and plan of God for the ministry of the prophet there are some people that feel that the ministry of the prophet is simply to predict the future they feel that the ministry of the prophet is to see vision and dream dreams and simply interpret vision and dream there are people that will think that the ministry of the prophet is just to be able to say this will happen tomorrow this will happen in the next year but here we find the very plan of God that he brought out 
the children of Israel out of captivity, out of slavery. And he did that by the ministry of the prophet. When you think, therefore, of people that are enslaved by sin, taken captive by Satan, and you have an individual minister bringing them out of that slavery, of that captivity, that's part of the ministry of the prophet according to the Bible. Not only that he brought them out, but he preserved the nation, teaching them the word of God that will preserve them, that will preserve them as a distinct, separated kingdom, a kingdom of priests unto the Lord, which tells us then the important part of the ministry of the prophet. By a prophet, he brought Israel out. By the ministry of a prophet, he kept Israel in, out of and into. That describes the ministry of a minister today, of a pastor, a preacher today. One, you are to bring people out of the world, and then two, you are to keep them in the kingdom of God. And that is all that leadership is about. The place of the leader is very central in the history and the progress of the church. That is why it is the number one target of the devil to oppose leadership, to destroy leadership, smite the shepherd, and a sheep of the fold shall be scattered. If the devil could destroy and ruin leadership, if the devil could one way or the other use some people to bring down leadership, it will not take time. The church itself will be brought down. There is an inseparable link between the pastor's life and the life of the church. If you want to know what a church looks like, look at their pastor. If you want to know the commitment of the church, the lifestyle in that church, the vision and consecration in that church, if you want to know the emphasis of that church, look at the pastor. Because there is that inseparable link between the pastor's life and the life of the church. In Hosea chapter 4 verse 9, it says, And there shall be like people, like priests. That is why there's always been a premium set on good leadership. A spiritually qualified leader can be an awesome instrument in the hand of God. Somebody put it this way in writing. He said, give me a man whose faith is master of his mind. And I will right all wrongs and bless all mankind. He says, what I need is a man. A man that is controlled by this faith once delivered unto the saints. In his mind, in his thought, in his disposition, in everything that he does, everything is controlled by the faith once delivered unto the saints. Give me such a man. I can make all rights to be all wrongs to be right, and I can bring humanity back to God. He says, Give me a man, just one man whose tongue is touched with heaven's fire, and I will flame the darkest heart with high resolve and clean desires. It brings us once again to what we said on the first night, that God needs a leader, a spirit-filled leader, a scripture-saturated leader, a leader with the hand of God upon him, a leader that in his own life every yoke of the devil has been broken and he sees himself as being sent forth by the lord to break every yoke that's what we need in every community give me a man a man of god true to the vision that he sees and i will build the broken walls and bring the nation to their knees and bring peace on earth and of course god is looking for such leaders he calls and he qualifies those that he intends to use to build his church, to do the work of the kingdom. And I want to 
perhaps slowly and yet in a very thorough manner goes through these points with you number one the call to spiritual leadership the call to spiritual leadership number two qualifications for spiritual leadership qualifications for spiritual leadership number three self-examination and consecration for leadership let's come to point number one the call to spiritual leadership the call to leadership is so sacred that none should presume to take the position without being called there are many people that just get into the ministry for different kinds of motives but if you get into the ministry on the wrong note because of wrong motive the Lord will not be able to use you to do something very definite not only that there will be no reward for doing what you are doing because you are not called into it by the Lord in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7 and the Lord said I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters I know their sorrows in verse 10 come now therefore and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people the children of Israel out of Egypt that is the call of Moses perhaps you are familiar with that call of Moses God called him and God is still in the business of calling people into the ministry calling people into leadership we're going to examine those verses 7 and 10 but before we do I want you to see something in the heart of Moses because we should begin to wonder why should God go to the backside of the desert and call an isolated lonely man and bring him to the land of Egypt were there not people of the children of Israel many of them in Egypt were there not people that knew of the suffering of the children of Israel right there in Egypt wasn't Aaron there all these other elders that were chosen later they were in Egypt all the people that were later appointed as heads of thousands heads of hundreds heads of fifties and tens they were in Egypt and this Moses the lonely isolated man was at the backside of the desert why did God pass over the tens and the hundreds and the thousands of the people in the land of Egypt among the children of Israel and he went to the backside of the desert to call a man and send him forth to get the work done there is a reason why the same question you should be asking yourself how is it that even today that God will bypass he will overlook the hundreds and the thousands and the millions of people that profess to know the Lord that profess that they are children of God he will bypass them he will overlook them he will go to a lonely man isolated man at the back of the desert that we do not think has the quality to be able to do the work of God why did God bypass them? We have to turn to the New Testament to, up, to find the reason. In Hebrews chapter 11, from verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming exalting highly appreciating putting a great high value and premium on the reproach of Christ putting greater value on that greater than the greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward 
that shows you the kind of people God will call. The kind of people God is looking for. He's not looking for people who are haphazard, half-hearted, undecided, not fully yielded, not fully committed, who are looking for what they can gain, what they can get, what they can amass through working for God. He's looking for people like Moses. And if we can find that individual, that individual may be in a village. He may be in an isolated region of the nation. And he's a person that esteems the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And he will not mind to climb any mountain, to descend any valley, to suffer with the people of God. He's not looking for a rich, wealthy church. He's not looking for an established kind of enter enterprise whereby he can get involved. He's not looking for transfer to a place where they can meet all his needs and meet all the needs of his children, all the need of his family. In fact, he rejoices to suffer with the people of God. Those are the people the Lord calls. Now look at Exodus chapter 3. And in verse 7, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. The reason God was calling Moses is that the people were being afflicted. They were not enjoying the promises and the privileges of the covenant. And the Lord wanted to fulfill the covenant he made to Abraham. Because of this, he saw this man and he called him. And then in verse 10, he said, Come now, therefore. Come now, the time is right. This is the very time, Moses, I need you. Tomorrow may never come. Tomorrow will be too late. Therefore, it is now you have to respond. And I will send thee unto Pharaoh. A very difficult assignment. Because Moses knew the laws and the decrees in the court of Pharaoh. He was raised there. He knew the enmity of Pharaoh's court against the children of Israel. And it will be the very last thing he would ever have done. Do you know there are many people that will resist the call of God? Maybe because they listen to the radio, they hear the news, they know that in the Eastern Bloc, I'm not talking of Nigeria, I'm talking of the world, in the Eastern Bloc, they know the difficulties there. And then they begin to imagine, they begin to wonder, how will I be catered for? How will I be able to have all my personal, material, physical needs met? But Moses knew all that. He knew the difficulty. He knew that the children of Israel were just slaves. And they had nothing. There are people, if God is calling them to the Middle East, once again, I'm not talking of Nigeria, I'm talking of the world, into the Middle East, the Arab countries, They'll be thinking, oh, I know the difficulties there. Will I be able to have this? Will I be able to have that? But you see, Moses had a condition of heart, a condition of mind that he esteemed the reproach of Christ, suffering for Christ. He esteemed that greater riches than all the pleasures and all the provisions of Egypt. No wonder God saw something in him that he could depend upon and he could call him Come now, therefore. Do you know that where he was? All those 40 years, there was no threat to his life. Everything appeared convenient. He was happily married. And he had children too. And he had settled down. And he had got a profession he was doing. And there was no problem between him and his boss, Jethro. Everything was going on fine. And now God called him out of certainty into uncertainty. That's the call of God. And a call of God will come to you at such a time. And in such a way. And a call of God may be calling you to live certainty for uncertainty. But that's the way he calls. And if you really have what it takes to serve the Lord, you will respond to the call of the Lord. And you'll say, here am I, Lord, send me. In Psalm 78, Psalm 78, from verse 1.
from verse 70 he chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfolds from, the, from following the you, you great what young he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel is inheritance so he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands once again remember young David he still had quite a lot in front of him and his elder brothers one would have supposed should have been called they should have filled the vacancy but the elder brothers for one reason or the other known unto God they were not called into that kind of responsibility and I want you to understand because many times when you think about the call of David you are thinking of the call into royalty you are thinking of the call into kingship that's just the title it was a call to face Goliath it was a call to face the Philistines it was a call to fight every day of his life it was a call to deliver the children of Israel from the difficulties and the bondage they had he would have had a pleasant life on the hillside a peaceful life on the hillside a singing life by the hillside but the Lord called him and he called him right into battle and that is what the Lord is still doing today the call of God coming unto us it's not just calling us because of the title associated with the position to which we are called is calling us into responsibility and that responsibility will carry a lot of other things with it you remember the case of Elisha how he was called the Lord had told Elijah the Lord told Elijah that I have 7,000 men that have not bowed the knee to Baal and yet he said I have one man to take your place after you are done and that one man is Elisha Elisha was not looking for that position Elisha was not eyeing that position Elisha was not walking his way to that position he was simply just doing the work he knew how to do and then the mantle came upon him and do you know that immediately he had to give up everything that he had and of course I'm sure you remember the story of Elisha even after he started following Elijah he wasn't given messages to preach he wasn't given the sick to pray for he wasn't given demon possessed people to deliver he wasn't given any mighty great assignment all he did while Elijah was still alive was pouring water on the hand of Elijah not pouring pebbles in his hand not pouring sand in his shoe not throwing stone in his room pouring water on the hand of Elijah and by the time Elijah was going Elijah said ask what I will do for you before I be sent away from you Elijah didn't tell him what he will actually do all the revelations and the visions the Lord had given Elijah concerning this Elisha he wasn't told but the man had something in his heart he wanted not position he wanted the anointing of the Spirit of God don't look for position get the anointing if position is necessary it will come at its own time there are many people that are struggling to become region overseer region overseer there is nothing in that title other people are struggling to become state overseer there is nothing in that title absolutely nothing other people are struggling to become national overseer there is nothing absolutely nothing there seek the anointing and Elisha said 
that I will receive a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah said immediately, Elisha, you know something? That's a very hard saying, hard request. And then he gave a condition. He met the condition. You will know the case of Jonah. Jonah had been a prophet. He had already stood in the calling, in the position, in the office of a prophet. But then God now called him to an assignment. An assignment. You see, you might have been called by God. And already you are a pastor. Already you are doing a particular thing in the household of faith. That was a call of God. But then the call came. And the call will take him out of Israel unto Nineveh, a foreign land. Not only a foreign land, a foreign land that had been at enmity against the children of Israel. And Jonah didn't want that call. Do you know there are people today, you might have been called, and you might be a pastor in a locality. And then the call of God comes to you. As it came to Jonah, and the call of God says, leave that place, now go to Nineveh. The problem with Nineveh is that there is no single convert there. The problem with Nineveh is that no crusade had ever been held there. The problem with Nineveh is that the people were wicked, violently wicked. The problem is you will even not be sure of granting accommodation to a preacher in Nineveh. And God gave him the message he was to preach. And he said, you go and tell Nineveh, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Did Jonah respond to that call? No. But before you point accusing finger to Jonah, think about yourself. Are there not people here that God has called to places better than Nineveh? Are there not people here who have been in the ministry and you have been operating and officiating as a leader in an area and the Lord's call comes unto you to go to a place that is even still much, much better than Nineveh. And then you are doing everything possible, giving every excuse possible to run away from that place so that you will not get to the place God wants you to get to. But as Jonah was running away, the storm came. There are many storms that come in our lives because we're running away from the call of God. There are many troubles we bring into the lives of the people in the ship with us, into the lives of our wives, our children, because we're running away from the call of God. There are many havocs and dangers you bring even into the local church in which you are right now because you are a misfit. In that locality where you are, your assignment in that place is finished and ended. Nineveh should have been the place you should have been now, but because you are not there, there is trouble in the ship for the people with you there. But eventually, you know the story. When this man was in the whale's belly, he now began to pray. And as he began to pray, the Lord heard his prayer. But where did the fish, the whale, vomit Jonah at the very border of fulfilling the call of God. And immediately he landed there. The word of God came and said, Jonah, you remember what I told you? Do you remember the place you are to go? Now that's Nineveh. Just take steps now, move into Nineveh. And preach the word that I gave you. That's what the Lord is expecting for every one of us. There may be people here that the Lord had used me as a general superintendent to call you and to tell you, this is where you are going. That is where you are going. And with one method or the other, one argument or the other, one cover up or the other, or some other kind of things that people do cleverly. You are trying to avoid that call. It's there on record in heaven. 
whatever else you do, you are wasting your life and wasting your time. And whatever else you are looking for and seeking for, by remaining in the ship, and you refuse to go to that Nineveh, you can waste precious years like those children, like the sun for us. And a dream you think you have in your mind, they will become eventually shattered dreams. At the end of life, you will look back and eventually, because if these hold their peace and they keep quiet, God will raise up stones that will get the job done. When we get to heaven, I'm not sure you can get there if you don't do the whole will of God, but we will get there. When we get to heaven, we will see those Ninevites. Jonah might not accept to do it, but somebody will do it. Because God has a thousand and one people to replace just one rebellious, disobedient Jonah. You want to make sure that you give yourself, you offer yourself unto the Lord. And that you say, Lord, not what I want, it is what the Lord wants. The call of God is not calling us to pleasure. It's not calling us to convenience. It's not calling us to what we want to do. It's calling us to something that may even demand our very lives. He gave all for us. What are we willing to give to the Lord and for the Lord? Here is what this officer in the early, in the early part of the Salvation Army, what he said. This is Samuel Brengel. He said, the call is not won by promotion but by many prayers and tears. It is not attained, it is attained by much heart searching and humbling before God. Uh, Samuel Brengo said, this call into the ministry, the call into leadership, it is by self-surrender. He said, it is by a courageous sacrifice of every idol. If you are going to respond to the call of God, you will have to sacrifice every idol every idol and let me tell you a very good thing can be an idol members of the choir please pardon me for my illustration music is wonderful we have been ministered to very wonderfully with music and yet if god calls any of these uh, my brothers and sisters to get into a particular assignment, preaching the word of God, that may take them away from the music team or from those who are singing. If they refuse, that music is no more serving the Lord. It has become an idol. Violin can become an idol. A trumpet can become an idol. An organ can become an idol. Even things that are good and right and legitimate, if it takes you away from fulfilling the call of God, it can become an idol. And so Samuel Brengo said, if we are going to respond to the call of God, you know what we need to do? We'll need to courageously sacrifice every idol. He said, it will take a bold, uncompromising, uncomplaining embracing of the cross. That's what Moses did. He embraced the reproaches and the suffering for Christ. That is, for the gospel, for the word of the Lord, that he might be able to fulfill the call that God has for him. He said this call is not gained by seeking great things for ourselves, but by counting those things that are gained to us as loss and dung for Christ. He said such will be a leader whose power and influence will be felt on earth felt in heaven then he added and even in hell itself by saying this or that is the type of man god is looking for and as we come here to the leadership congress the thing that the lord is expecting from you and from me is to be able to embrace the cross and appreciate suffering for Christ and say, Lord, it may not be the place I wanted to go, but the place you want me to go. It's like saying, here am I, Lord, send me. Anywhere it is, I will go. The song will launch in the afternoon. And that is what brings you into responding to the call of God. Let me just tell you about five things concerning this call. Number one, the call is an important call. 
It's a very sacred thirst. Do you know that in the early church, people did not rush into the ministry for the wrong reason? Why? Because there was great risk. Because of the danger involved. Because, you know, at that time the church was persecuted. And the leaders and the pastors and the missionaries of the early church, they didn't have great prestige and prominence in the community for leading in the church. In fact, there was no security. There was no finance. And there was no compensation. There was no guarantee about anything. And so the people that got into the ministry, that responded to the call in the Bible days, there were people that recognized it was an important call. Number two, it is a limited calling. It is a limited calling. Leadership is just for very few people. Few in comparison with the population of the world. When we say it is limited, in what way is it limited? Number one, it's limited to the converted. The blind cannot lead the blind. Two, it is limited to the consecrated. The one that is seeking for pleasure or seeking for great things for himself cannot fulfill the call and the call will not come to him. If it comes to him, there's no way he can respond. If the call is limited to converted people, to consecrated people. Three, the call is limited to spirit-filled people. The people that are filled with the Spirit of God, immersed in the Spirit of God, they see nothing in the world except what the Spirit makes them to see. The call is limited to those who are willing to bear the cross and deny themselves. The people who are willing to serve unselfishly. The call is limited to gifted men who are willing to lead souls from earth to heaven. Do you know what the Bible says? It says, he gave some, not everybody, the call is limited. He gave some apostles. Not that those people grabbed the office of the apostles. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. The call is limited. Not only that is said, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28, still talking about how limited the call is. Telling us it's not every Christian that comes into Christian leadership. God has set some. Some. He has set some as what? In the church, first apostles. Secondly, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. Verse 29. Are they all apostles? No. Why? Because the call is limited. Are all prophets? No. Because the call into that ministry is limited. Are they all teachers? No. Why? Because the call is limited. Are they all workers of miracles? No. Because the call is limited. Not all good people will become pastors. Not all saved people will become leaders in the church. Why? Because it's not the plan of God to make all believers pastors. It's not the program of God to make all saved, sanctified, spirit-filled people on earth to make every one of them pastors. He gave some evangelists, some prophets, some he gave to be pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Number three, it is a compelling, irresistible call. You remember in, in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, it said, he wanted to keep quiet, but the word was like fire shut up within him, and he could not endure, he could not stop, he could not cease, he could not bear anymore. He had to speak out, because it's a compelling, irresistible call. Called men are men of one goal. 
men of one passion, men of one ambition, men of one choice in life, only the work of the ministry. Those are the people that are called, the people that in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, in the night, that's the only thing they are thinking about. The call of God upon their lives. And what the Lord wants them to do. Not the office. Not the title. Not the name. The real work. The assignment. The job. The preaching of the gospel. Leading people to know the Lord. This desire is not the prompting of a carnal heart. Who longs only to be seen by others. But this is the experience of the heart that has seen the heavenly vision and it wants to get the job done. Number four, it is a responsible calling. The calling into leadership is a responsible calling. In First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into condemnation of the devil the call is a responsible calling because he is to feed the church he is to lead the church he is to rule he is to mature the saints he is to teach the church that is a great responsibility feeding leading ruling maturing teaching and guiding that has to be a great responsibility he is to pray for the people he is to care for the people he is to instruct the people he is to supervise the work of the kingdom in their hands and is to deal with the sins of the members in the church that's a responsible calling not just anyone can step into such a thing and say this is what he wants to do. And if you have not dealt with sin in your own life, how can you deal with sin in the lives of other people? Immature people, irresponsible people, careless people, undisciplined people have no place in leadership in the church. As we look at all this, look at your own life. Are you responsible enough to really be a leader? Disciplined enough to be a leader? Righteous and holy enough to be a leader? The call into leadership is not for little babies and little children. It's not for the people that are so immature, so careless, so irresponsible and disciplined. That even in their lives, their lives are not well coordinated together. So then, it's a responsible calling. Number five, it's a noble yet demanding calling. A noble yet demanding calling. It's noble because the work of preaching is the highest and the greatest and the most glorious calling to which anyone can ever be called. Any profession anybody has in this world, it may even be in the government of a nation. It may even get to the president, to being the president of a nation. All that still cannot be compared with the privilege of preaching the gospel that saves souls. And if God counts anyone worthy of the call, and he calls him into the ministry to declare the eternal truth of the gospel that will get souls saved. Bring them into the kingdom of God. What a noble calling that is. But it's not only noble, it is demanding. It's a lifelong work that demands expending energy. It's very tiring working for the Lord. It is not for the lazy people who like to sleep most of the day. It is not for lazy people who cannot read a chapter of the Bible on their own in one whole week. It is not for lazy people who have forgotten how to kneel or stand in prayer. 
It is not for lazy people who have not gone into the regions beyond, into the localities to see that sinners are perishing and to see what he has to do in bringing the gospel unto them. Demanding calling. A kind of calling that will make you to expend energy. And it is all your life long. All your life long. When I see the trend of what happens in the world, and all those things happening in the world are coming into the church, I just realized that perhaps the problem is that not many people really have the call to serve the Lord. Do you know what happens in the world? In the world, uh, once in a while, in a particular year, the people who are working in the world might have 35 days of work. And they just tell them in their place of work, go home, go and do whatever you want. You want to go and swim? You want to go and do hunting and farming? You want to go and scale the mountains? You want to go to the spring waters? You want to go to some places where you just see the beauty of nature? Go for 35 days and go and rest. They call it leave. I see that coming into the church. And I see preachers taking leave. Preachers not wanting to preach. Preachers wanting to go to the mountains. Wanting to go and do hunting. Wanting to go to farms. Wanting to go to the waterside. Wanting to go to this and that. And say, I'm now on leave. And somebody comes for counseling. Oh, my leave is five weeks. Come back after five weeks. And we need to plan a crusade. Oh, I cannot have time for that now. You see, this is my only leave during the whole year. And for these five weeks, even to open the Bible and read, because, you know, I'm not in ministry now. I'm, you know, resting now. I don't find that in my Bible. And you, Deeper Life Bible Church, you know the sorrow of my heart, those of you in Nigeria. The sorrow of my heart is that even though I preach it, and even though I say it, there are people in this church I don't know whether they are planted by God or planted by Satan. There are people in this church that whatever you preach, they are still going to bring the ideology of the world into the church. And they are still going to say, this is what Pentecostal church does, this is what Anglican church does, and they say this is what they are going to do in deeper life. But you know how I pray? I pray, and I've told you before, and I still pray that way. That every plant that my father has not planted in this church, he will root it out. You cannot be allowed in this church to bring in ideologies of the world, principles of the world, philosophies of the world, and say, that's how they do it there. Well, they didn't do it like that in Israel. See Moses and see all those years Although Jethro said, slow down. Slow down when he told him, didn't mean go on vacation. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season and reprove and rebuke with long suffering and doctrine. Do the work of an evangelist. Look at this. Honestly contending for the faith. Once delivered unto the saints. Where are you? That you are off to the mountainside and you are off resting. You are all taking care of this and taking care of that and souls are perishing. If you have gone into the principle and philosophies and psychologies of the world, come back. If you don't come back, if you think that you are going to do anything unscriptural in this place, you know, I have no other prayer. I don't pray for personal things. The greatest of my prayer is that, Lord, look at this church and look at the holiness standard. And look at the foundation that is there. And I say, Lord, the Lord knows how weak I am. I talk strong, but you know how weak I am. i weak. But you know, in my weakness, I go to the Lord. And I say, Lord, don't give me money. What do I need money for? Don't give me anything. Don't give me clothes. <laughs> this jacket I have, I could burn it. It's nothing to me. I say, Lord, only one single prayer I have. This is your kingdom, our Father which art in heaven. 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And I say, Lord, I am for this kingdom. You see any plant here that the Father has not planted? That wants to bring error, bring evil, bring the world. Bring all those things they are doing in the world into this place. I say, Lord, I may love those people ignorantly. I may not even know that it is not you that planted them there. I say, Lord, don't care for me how I will feel, whether it will pain me or it will not pain me. Oh, Lord, if you do something just to expand your kingdom, even if it will pain me, I say, Lord, every plant you have not planted, root it out. And you watch, he's going to do it. The call into the ministry is a kind of call that demands your very life, don't you see? Until Moses was about to die like this, he was still doing the work of the Lord. He didn't retire at 40, at 50, at 60. Ah, you have forgotten your Bible? He started at 80. You are stopping before 80. He started the work at 80. And then when the day came, and he walked continuously for 40 years. Do I have time to tell you? He fasted for 40 years. He also labored for 40 years. And as he labored, he came to the place. And there was something that had happened. You know the story. Why he couldn't get into the land of Canaan itself. But God said, Moses, I remember you. Although I will not compromise my principles with you, and I will not just allow you to get in there because I said you will not get there. But I know your sacrifice, and I know that at 120 years of age, you are still laboring. Come to the mountain top here and look over. That's the place. Just a step, you would have been there. But Moses, here we are. And that man on the mountain top, he saw it. He saw it. And he said, Lord, help me get there. He said, Moses, don't talk about that. God is God. And man is man. But he honored him, though. The man died there. And Almighty God buried him there. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for people that see your body is even given to God after you die. That you don't have all this kind of pomp and all this kind of merriment that says like somebody so and so died, let us do this and do that. Moses had been buried by God. The work of the Lord is something that you do until the very last breath that you are saying, Lord, here am I. Use me. And we have people like that here tonight. You know, I'll be praying for you. If you love the Lord, because I'm in the company of the people that love the Lord. I don't have any friends. I don't have any favorites. If you're a child of God, if you're serving the Lord, if you're saying, Lord, I surrender, I want to serve you. If you want to preach, I want to help you to preach. I want to encourage you to preach. I want to train you to preach. That's what connects us, not French. How can I be friendly with anybody? Because you see, if sin comes, I'm going to rebuke that thing. And you know that I cannot have a favorite. How can you? You need to stand. But if you are willing to respond to the call, and you say, Lord, I want to serve you, and I want to do the work of the Lord, if I know you, I'll be praying for you. And even if I don't know you, I say, Lord, we don't know when the Lord will come. Should the Lord tarry? Help us, Lord. Raise up Ezekiel. That will go to all these places. And isn't that the joy, the only joy I have when I see an Ezekiel there? <laughs> an Ezekiel there. An Ezekiel there. Preaching the word of God. What else? What else do I want in life? Just an Ezekiel. You know, in Nigeria here, those of you outside will not understand. They argue about state overseer, region overseer. I pity those people. I'm not looking for state overseer. I'm looking for Ezekiel. 
In that region, I need an Ezekiel. In that local government, I need an Ezekiel. Call them any name you want. I want them and I want to know them. And put some of the fire inside here that is burning that I cannot contain and pass it on to them. It doesn't worry me whether they are state overseers or region overseers. I want the fire to come and consume their hearts and reach out in those places that are darkened by idolatry, by evil, and send them there and shake that whole community for the Lord and bring them into the kingdom of God. And when this region and that region and that region, they are all brought to the Lord and then the trumpet sounds in heaven. It says, children, all the people are saved, let us go home. That's what we want. What else do you want? But that the call of God will come upon your life. And that he'll make you an Ezekiel where you are. He'll bring the fire of God upon your life where you are. And you will say, Lord, I am ready to serve you. Do or die. Wherever it is, money or no money. I want to serve the Lord. Why don't you rise up and say, here am I, Lord. I want to serve you. Here am I, Lord. I want to serve you. Here am I, Lord. I want to serve you. Serve the Lord. Serving. We need preachers. We need preachers. We need preachers. People that can preach the gospel. People that will go to the darkest place of this nation and go and preach. And go and preach. And go and preach. And declare the truth of the everlasting gospel. We need preachers. Surrender your life. Surrender your life. Surrender your life. Surrender your life and say, Lord, here I am. Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. Give your life to the Lord. There is only one thing to do in life. Only one thing to do in life, preaching the word of the kingdom. And that's why we came here, that the Lord will put his fire, his anointing, his power, his truth, his knowledge. He'll put everything within us. We need you. Let's see if you want to serve the Lord, we need you. If you want to preach the gospel, we need you. If you want to reach out to all the nooks and corners of your nation, we need you. If you don't care for position, you don't care for power, you don't care for authority, you don't care for materials, you don't care for title, we need you. If you are not looking for convenience in life, we need you. If all you are looking for is to preach the word of God, preach the word of God, preach the word of God, every moment, every minute, with the very last drop of blood in your body. If you want to preach the gospel like that, then we need you. Preach the word and leave the titles alone. Preach the word and leave money alone. Preach the word and leave the conveniences of life alone. Preach the word and never care, don't care about any other thing. Just preach, preach, preach the word. Don't hold on to any idol. Don't hold on to any idol. Don't hold on to any idol. Smash that idol on the ground. Break that idol. Destroy that idol. Say, Lord, I come. I surrender my life to preach. I want to preach. Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. Have you got the calling? This is a church established by the Lord. It's not for position seekers. It's not for those who want a lot of conveniences when no job is not getting, no job is getting done. Souls are not getting saved. The territories are not being converted and conquered for the Lord. We don't want to sit and just call ourselves bishop and this and that. Arise and do the work of the Lord. Arise and do the work of the Lord. 
Endure hardness. Endure hardness. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Your life without Christ will be a shattered dream. Without the plan of God, without the purpose of God, will be shattered dream. Why don't you just lay everything upon the altar and say, here I come, here I come, here I come. I want to serve the Lord. Surrender your very life to the Lord and respond to the call of God wherever he wants you to go.